This morning we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. We broke down this verse and we looked at it. And as I was studying this, I was noticing the flow of thought and was thinking about the rest of the verses that follow uh, this verse and figured that I would go ahead and do a follow-up sermon in which we explain some of the uh, verses that follow the wonderful verse that we studied this morning concerning Jesus Christ. As we studied this morning that Christ also suffered once for sins. We talked about this morning how that Jesus was the one time all sufficient sacrifice for sins on the cross. The just for the unjust, how that Jesus was perfectly just. He was sinless. He was the spotless Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. John 1 and verse 29, we were the unjust ones. We were the reason He had to go to the cross. And therefore, that He might bring us to God. His death was the purpose of bringing us into fellowship with God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He was put to death in the flesh. He took on flesh. John 1 and verse 14, He died on the cross, but the Holy Spirit was the one who resurrected Him from the dead. But that thought continues, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. Verse 19, By whom also He went and preached to spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Verse 18 through 20 is one sentence. And so the thought continues, and therefore the sermon continues tonight, following verse 18. In verse 19 it says, By whom? By the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, He, which refers back to Christ, went and preached to the spirits in prison. Spirits in prison. Who were these spirits who were in prison? What is that talking about? Well, verse 19 says, Who, referring back to those spirits, formerly were disobedient. Well, when were they disobedient? When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. So we're talking about those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. You remember Genesis chapter 6, how God was grieved that He made man. He said, I'm going to destroy all flesh from off the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous individual in his generation. And we see that he was chosen to build a giant vessel, <coughs> an ark. And that ark was to hold those who would be willing to enter in by it, into it by faith, and the animals that God wanted to survive the flood and survive and repopulate the earth after the flood. So we see here that what Peter is talking about is those who were formerly disobedient when once this long suffering waited in the days of Noah. But the puzzling thing is, verse 19, when did Christ, by the Spirit, go and preach to the spirits in prison? I believe that there are two logical, rational explanations to this verse that harmonize with the rest of the Scripture. Then we talk about the, the one, the third option, that it cannot be. There is a doctrine which says that there is a second chance after death. That you have a second chance after death to hear the gospel if you rejected it in this life. And as a result of hearing the gospel in the next life, you'll have a chance to be saved if you did not have a chance to hear it in this life or you ignored it in this life. And they base it on this verse. Jesus preached to spirits in prison, talking about those spirits of dead people who were in prison in the Hadean realm. 
they were preached to, given a chance to be saved. Well, that option is completely false because it contradicts various other passages. One rule of interpretation is when you are interpreting or trying to figure out what a passage means, it cannot contradict other plain teachings of the Bible. If your understanding or interpretation of a difficult passage contradicts other plain teachings of the Bible, that interpretation is false. So we know that is false. Why do I know that? Hebrews 9 and verse 27. It's appointed unto men once to die, after that the judgment. There is not going to be a second chance in the spiritual realm. The reason why I know that is Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. They both died, and the rich man was in torment in Hades, and Lazarus was in paradise, or Abraham's bosom, in Hades. And Abraham says there is a great gulf that is fixed between those who are in torment and those who are in paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And he says people cannot cross over. There is no crossing over. Lazarus cannot give you any relief, just a drop of water on your tongue. And you cannot come over here. It's a fixed gulf or expanse in the spiritual realm. Those in torment cannot go to paradise. And those in paradise cannot go to torment. I mean, why would you want to? If you're in paradise, why would you want to go to torment? But we would understand why those in torment would want to go to paradise, but they can't. The gulf is fixed. So there is no way that this interpretation can be correct. Well, let's look at it this way. There are two possible interpretations which I think harmonizes with the rest of the Scriptures. Look at verse 19. When did and how did Christ by the Holy Spirit preach to people? Well, we know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, God says, I'm going to give man 120 years. That refers to how that there was 120 years until that flood was going to come from the point in which God made that pronunciation. And so it is believed that during that 120 year period of time, while Noah was preparing the ark, that he was preaching. And that he was preaching by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit of Christ, which is also the Holy Spirit, another way of describing the Holy Spirit, was speaking through Noah. He was an inspired preacher. The reason why I know the Spirit of Christ spoke through the prophets of old is 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11. The Spirit of Christ prophesied in those Old Testament prophets. And Noah, being an inspired preacher, would have been preaching by the Spirit of God. Okay, so this was during the time of Noah before the flood, but the Holy Spirit was preaching through Noah. The Spirit of Christ was preaching through Noah. Christ, not Himself literally, but the Holy Spirit of Christ as the representative of God was speaking through Noah. Now, verse 19 again, 1 Peter 3 and verse 19, to those spirits in prison. The spirits in prison. It could be referring to the fact that these spirits were people in prison in the bondage of sin. Did not Jesus talk about sin being a bondage in John chapter 8? You're in bondage to sin, He told the Jews. In bondage. In Romans chapter 6, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said that when you obey unrighteousness, you're in bondage, you're a slave to unrighteousness. And sometimes the Bible refers to a person who's still alive as a spirit. How do I know that? 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
So I am a spirit that you're to put to the test. I'm not a disembodied spirit. I'm still alive. But I am a spirit, a person who has a spirit or a soul, that you're to put to test by the Word of God to see whether I'm speaking what's right. So sometimes a human being can be referred to just as a spirit, as in 1 John 4 and verse 1. So back to the text, 1 Peter 3 and verse 19, when Noah was preaching by the Holy Spirit to the spirits in prison, they were in bondage to sin. And they were destroyed in the flood because they did not heed to the preaching of Noah. When you read Genesis chapter 6, you see the wickedness was great upon the earth, that every thought and intent of their heart was on evil continually. It was so bad, the whole human race was so bad that only eight people were found faithful in the population of the earth. That's a pretty bad situation. You could say that's prison, that's in bondage to sin. The second one, which is a more common interpretation of this scripture that, again, harmonizes with the rest of the Bible, is that the spirits are currently in prison when Peter wrote this. They're in spiritual prison, in torment. Those spirits are in prison when Peter wrote this. Who were formerly, in the past, were disobedient. They're now in the Hadean realm as the wicked people go to this prison or torment when they die in a lost condition having rejected God. And so as Peter is writing this, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's their current condition. How did they get in that situation? Verse 20, who were formerly uh, were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God uh, or the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, eight souls, were saved through water. The point is this. The Spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit, inspired Noah to preach while the ark was being built. And the ones that he could get to be convinced were seven others. After preaching for 120 years. You talk about someone that would be classified as a failure among so many brethren today. You mean you preach for 120 years and only have a congregation of eight? Few there be that find it. Jesus said, few there be that find it. He was a preacher of righteousness, and he's held up as someone who is a success in the New Testament. Not based on his numbers. In fact, in fact the Holy Spirit emphasizes the small numbers, I think, to get a point across to us. Notice what the Holy Spirit says here. He says, uh, these were the ones who were punished, or disobedient, excuse me, in verse 20, in the time of God's long-suffering and patience, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, how, how few? That is, eight souls were saved through water. You see the emphasis on the small numbers that, that he's emphasizing here? The number of people faithful to God is not what matters. It's the strength of their faithfulness that matters. I used to hear Johnny Ramsey preach all the time. He passed away in 2006. And I remember him saying many times that he would rather preach for a congregation of 30 rock-solid Christians who want to do what's right than 300 that want to play church. And we need to get back to that attitude. That we don't want to play church. We want to be a church that is faithful. And let God give the increase, and He will. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We plant, we water, God will give the increase. Back to our text. So we see here that only a few, eight souls, were saved through water. And then he draws the analogy or the type to the antitype. The world was immersed in water, destroyed by water. 
And that saved Noah and his family. Separated Noah and his family from the wicked world. And when the waters receded, he was now on a new world to start over. Verse 21, the New King James says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter here is making it very clear that it is not the water that removes sin. It's not the water removing filth from the flesh. Filth from the flesh is not what defiles a person. It is the filth of the soul. The stain of sin on a person's soul. And so just as God destroyed the world by water and eight souls were saved through water, God saves us in water, in the water of baptism. The flood is the type. Baptism is the antitype, which now saves us. And when you read it without the parenthetical statement, it says this. There is also an antitype which now saves us baptism through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's the power of baptism, Jesus, through His resurrection. Remember, we studied this morning in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, we're baptized into His death and raised up just as He was raised up. And so it's through that resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are saved. What has Christ done? He has resurrected from the dead. What happens to us when we obey Him in baptism? We're resurrected from the dead to walk a new life purified by the blood of Christ. Revelation 1 and verse 5. Then in verse 22, He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. Jesus, before He ascended, when He gave the Great Commission, in Matthew 28 and verse 18, said, All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus has all authority. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess to the glory of God. Philippians chapter 2 tells us. He has gone into heaven, is it at the right hand? That means he's at a place of authority. That's why he's the head of the body, the church, Colossians 1 and verse 18. He has authority over the angels. Angels and authorities and powers having been subject, made subject to Him. Now, He has authority over the angels. Number one reason is because He created them. Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1, along with John 1, all make it very clear that Christ is the Creator. He has authority over all the spiritual beings. They are creatures. And uh, when you look at Hebrews chapter 1... It makes it very clear that to none of the angels did God ever assign sonship. In Hebrews chapter 1, talking about Jesus, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will grow old like a garment and like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? They are creatures. God created them through Jesus Christ. Therefore, these angels are under his authority. That's interesting because the Bible tells us that humans are made a little bit lower than the angels. But Christ, as the Son of God, is exalted above the angels. As not just a man, but as God, at the right hand of the Father, He's exalted above the angels. All authority and power have been made subject to Him. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. But only a few will subject themselves to Him. Most of the world will follow the God of this world with a little g, which is Satan. The church is the kingdom. 
subject to Christ. We know the sad fact that Jesus said in Matthew 22 and verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. In some cases, it's as few as eight souls. Many are called, but few are chosen. Few will actually believe and obey and endure and remain faithful till death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Are we of that few? Are we the faithful few? Are we being subject to Christ in every aspect of our life? Is He Lord of our life? Not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. Is He Lord of our life? Every single day of our life. Are we subjecting ourselves to Him? If not, we urge you to do so. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to believe in Christ. Confess He's the Son of God and repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that, you're rebelling against Christ. We urge you to repent and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and sing.